Hello, everyone. Um, so I, uh, my name is Miriam. I'm the science editor of The Conversation. Has anybody heard of that? A few of you. Great. OK. Has anybody written? OK. <laughs> So, um, yeah, so The Conversation is a news, opinion and analysis website and it's for the general public. It looks just like any other um, news site, as you can see. There's, you know, rolling Twitter feed, editor's picks. Um, we cover every subject from arts to um, environment, politics and, and science. And, um, yeah, so I'm the science editor, so we're in charge of this page. Um, but I'll just talk a little bit more generally about what it is and why it was set up. So um, the conversation s was set up first in Australia uh, by a man called Andrew Jaspin, who um, was the editor of The Age there and formerly the editor of The Observer here. And um, he set it up in response to kind of um, struggling newspaper industry where a lot of uh, journalistic expertise, um, specialist reporters, and there were lots of cuts. And he thought, where can we get all that expertise in journalism that we can no longer pay for, basically? And um, the truth is that the, all that expertise exists in universities. There, is, there are experts on basically anything that you want. And that was kind of the idea behind the conversation. If you can get, uh, if you can see universities as sort of a like, global newsroom where um, you can get reporters working together with professional editors and you can create something that has um, um, yeah that works as a specialist journalistic enterprise that is based on research and research voices and that has that level of expertise that we so badly need today um, and um, so all the articles in the conversation are creative commons which means that they're free to read but they're also free for others to republish and so uh, we have a long list of republishers. So, uh, you know, yeah, it's a long list, but it includes uh, the CNN, the Daily Mail, the Independent, um, the Guardian, the um, Newsweek, to more kind of specialized publications like uh, Scientific American or like big internet, um, popular internet sites like IFL Science, if anyone's heard of that. Um, they have a huge following. So if you do publish a story on the conversation, sometimes it will appear in lots of these places at the same time, which gives you a big audience. Uh, and it's, it's very different from having um, a quote from you as a researcher published in one newspaper article somewhere. Um, so when you write for us, um, I'll just show you what it looks like, because it's actually a really helpful kind of CMS content management system we have. So I'm taking this in as, as an example. It's from Cambridge. Um, there were all these rumors about how um, uh, executives in Silicon Valley were taking tiny doses of LSD, not to get high, but to just make them more creative. And so we got basically three um, experts to review all the evidence on this. Uh, is there any truth to it? You know, this was something that was in the news that people were interested in reading about. And of course, there are experts who would know a bit more. So um, when you write for us, you write in a system that looks like this. And there are lots of tips here to, sorry, to help you get started. You know, how do you write a good headline? You can kind of click on these and get some tips. And also, there's a readability count here, which um, basically counts how long and complicated your sentences are. And so if that is read, that means that you are writing for other academics, which is not really <laughs> helpful for us. <laughs> and if it's orange, it means you're writing for university students, which may be OK. But then you're aiming for green, which is sort of like a high school level. You know, it, it should be something that could be read by a Daily Mail reader as well as uh, some other, you know, Scientific American reader. So that's, that's what we're aiming for. Um, so that the, the, the thought is that you can write about complicated things. You can write about big ideas, but you can still use a simple language to do it. Um, however, these are just kind of like, that's a guide and we don't, you know, you know it's, a, it's a help for you to write. But then these stories get edited by us. And so every single change that's been made to an article gets logged in our system, which is also very helpful. If you want to go back and see how it's changed, you know, I'm the red person here now because this was submitted to me in Word. I pasted it into here 
And so every single change that's been made has been saved. And typically, I do some editing, then I send it back to the researchers with some questions and suggestions, and then they, they get to, um, to review it. And then eventually, we come to a conclusion, and, and my editor will read it too. And so um, in this case, the headline is a, is, a, is a question. A lot of time is spent on the headline. Um, and that's because we're actually reviewing something to see whether something is true or not. But generally, a question is not the best way to do a headline. And so what we typically will get that will sum up what this experience feels like is something like an academic submitting the headline um, is X, Y. And then I will change it to X is Y. And then in the end, we'll agree on it being X may be Y. <laughs> that's kind of what this feels like. Um, you can, uh, you can also, like, you can always see what it's going to look like, the finished article, what it's going to look like on a phone. Um, and where it says republish, uh, before the article has been published, there's a button there called approval. And before you guys have approved an article, we cannot publish it. So you have a little bit more control than when speaking to a journalist on the phone, taking a quote might be slightly taken out of context, whatever. Um, you should still do that, but it's just if you're feeling, um, I don't know, insecure about doing it, maybe this is a good first step to just uh, know how it works. And you know, even though the articles get edited a lot, in the end, you'll have something that you know and you're happy with. And if somebody wants to republish your article, they are not allowed to change anything. So it will look exactly the, the way it looked when we published it. Um, you also need to fill out this disclosure statement here. It's basically just to say where you get your research money from, if you own shares in a company, if you're a member of a political party, anything like that that, that, might, uh, that has anything to do with the article. You know, if you're writing about this and you're a member of a party, it's not really maybe that relevant. But um, yeah, so that's what that's for. Um, and then the best thing is once you've published your article, you get a lot of metrics to play with. So in this case, I'm just trying to see this. Uh, she's written loads of articles, but um, yeah, so this one got um, 170,000 reads. And you can see the breakdown, you know, it goes outside of the UK, it's, it's got an international reach. You can follow every single tweet, every th single comment, Facebook shares, everything. Um, about the article. And as you can see, here is a list of the republishers that took this article, and they range from, you know, the Daily Mail, the Independent, to Newsweek. And so they're quite, and IFL Science, so they're quite like different publications, but they've all republished the same story. And so, let's see if we can, yeah. So it's, it's exactly the same story, and it will just say at the bottom that it was first published. Uh, on the conversation. So it, it, it's your story and, and there you go. Um, we are also trying to, there's a blue button, what happened after writing this article where we're encouraging researchers to kind of fill out um, additional information like were they invited to talk on a TV show, uh, were they called up by other journalists, uh, did they find new collaborators, we have had all sorts of cases so in a way it's a good way to keep track of something that might lead to impact in a sort of rough sense. Because um, you can, you, you have all this data, and we're trying to find ways to log more and more. So you know, was your um, was your article quoted in a government report? Was it debated in Parliament? Whatever you know, you can put all that stuff in there. Um, yeah. So so that's what it's like to write for us. And I'll just say a few words about how to find stories. Um, what kind of stories we look for. Oh, uh. right. Can I just do like that? Yeah. Right. So different types of stories we do is uh, an explainer of something that's in the news. Basically, my advice to you is to just follow the news agenda and see where your research fits in. Um, it could be a comment or analysis of something that's going on right now. I mean, we are very driven by the news agenda, but we also kind of uh, set our own agenda by covering certain research and, and, and so forth. Um, it could also be a new research, a new paper coming out, that's news. Um, it could be 
more kind of less newsy thing, but an answer to an interesting question. I will give you some examples of these, um, or kind of a broad topic that has a news pig. So if you have done some research on, I don't know, football players, um, the, the, a brain scanning study or something like that of football players and there's a World Cup coming up, maybe that's a good time to kind of write about that, even though it's not completely new. But the, you can usually, by following the news agenda, see where your research can fit in. So, um, here's an example from Cambridge as well. Um, SpaceX did this and we basically just got someone to write about how you do that. And because it was in the news, there was a lot of interest in it, um, people wanted to read it at, about it at that time. Um, <coughs> here's a very good example of something so simple. What is polonium? For a physicist or a chemist, it's really easy to write 600 to 800 words about what is polonium. But because this Lufienko poisoning trial was going on, there was a lot of interest in this at that moment. And so it was uh, an easy story to write and uh, it got a lot of reads and it was really popular. Um, this is an example of just anal uh, analyzing a new model. Um, here's an example of um, new research, somebody writing about their own research and what it means, again, for a general kind of uh, audience, so slightly different from a journal article. Um, and here's an example, sometimes we get researchers to review other people's research, so that, that's what happened here. Um, and that's usually quite good if it's a kind of a controversial study coming out, or just maybe a study that's uh, not from one of our uh, member universities, I'll, I'll come back into the, to that, but yeah. Um, answer to an interesting question, um, could be something like that. Uh, another very effective way to make anything interesting to general audience, to make a list out of it. So here we had, there was uh, s some meteorite getting close to Earth, whatever, and, and we basically did a list of the, the five greatest balls of fire. Um, a more kind of a, a researchy, sciencey type story um, that kind of, um, again, been put into a list format. It's quite general, it's not about something very specific, but it, it works very well in that kind of format. And so, yeah, anything that's new, fun, dramatic, unusual, I'm sure you understand uh, what I'm talking about there. And so the most important thing with all this is that we hear about your opinion or your, <laughs> um, your research as soon as possible. Uh, something like in science, like the Nobel Prizes, or you know, we can't know ahead of time who's going to win, but we can we can plan. Like this year, it wasn't so hard to know that gravitational waves uh, discovery could get a Nobel Prize in physics. So we tried to sound people out before that time, and maybe try to make sure that we have a few people lined up in different subjects so that they can write a story about the winner within an hour or two after the announcement, really. Um, but we tend to get pitches from researchers two weeks later saying this person has just won the Nobel Prize, I can write about it, and by that time it's too late. So, you know, some of these, some of these topics are really pressing and need to go out straight away, and people who have written for us many times are completely able to do that, but you don't have to. Like, if you have a paper coming out in two weeks, you know, that's, and you tell us about it, then you have two weeks to write the story. So it doesn't have to be, you know, you don't have to do that as, as your, your first story that you do. Um, yeah, so I'll, I'll, I'll uh, uh, explain how to write for us. Um, you know, just follow the news as I said. You can pitch ideas to us on our website and I'll show you how to do that. Um, or you can respond to something called an expert request, which is something that goes out to all our member universities, so including Cambridge. So every morning the press office will get a list of stories we're looking for that day. And then they will look for experts within those areas um, to see if they can, they have someone who could write it. So if I go back to the website, um, yeah, so here, it's always hard to find. Here you can pitch an idea by clicking there, or you can just go to uh, our team, is that what it says there? Uh, and then you can just find the relevant editor and it will have all the contact information on there and you can just get in touch with us. Um, 
Yeah, so I was also going to explain uh, about how we're funded. So we are entirely funded by member universities, and we have about 75 universities that are members in the UK, including Cambridge. Um, and um, we, so we don't have any ads on the website. We don't have any agenda apart from just getting research voices out there, really. We're a charity. Um, so the conversation, there's an office in Australia, that's where it was first set up, and now there's also one in South Africa, there's one in the US, there's one in Canada, there's one uh, in uh, South Africa, did I say that? Yes. And one in France. Um, so yeah, there are lots of different offices, but we're all kind of divided by the universities that are members, but we have since Recently, we've also acquired uh, Lund University in Sweden as a member and uh, the University of South Denmark. So we're kind of expanding a little bit in North Europe. Um, but yeah, those are our main members here and funders. Um, so yeah, I hope that uh, this sounds interesting to you and that's something that you would consider. Uh, we also have a podcast that's, that we started quite recently that's more kind of um, traditional news reporting is which basically pick a topic for every every podcast episode and then we um, like a, bit, a grand theme like humor and then we pick three different um, specific pieces of research in there and we discuss we interview the researchers and stuff and that's been doing really well as well and we're experimenting a little bit with um, videos and uh, Facebook live and that sort of things to get a, um, a greater coverage so uh, our own website, we get about um, a million to two million readers uh, a month on the website. But when you take into account the fact that these stories get republished elsewhere, it goes up to 10 million. So our readers, you know, they're literally anyone who picks up a newspaper. Um, that's where we get our main uh, reads from. Um, yes, I, I thought I'd just check in if you have any questions. Yeah? Yeah. Um First of all, I absolutely love the conversation, it's brilliant. Um, some of our academics are obviously rightly concerned about the misrepresentation of research in the media, so you're um, republishing yeah. the process. Does that allow for newspapers to change the original publishing, or is it just no. publishing as is? Yeah, so they can't change anything. So we do have, for instance, we have um, a collaboration with the I newspaper, and so every Thursday they do a whole spread with our science and health stories. And there we, they might change the headline or change the stories a little bit to fit on the page, but they will send us the proofs um, the day before or, or whenever they can, and we can then check it with academics. So you keep control of the narrative, basically. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, they wouldn't completely rewrite something. It's more kind of like our stories are 600 to 800 words. Maybe they, they only have space for 500 words, something like that. Um, but yeah, and uh, sometimes the, you know, the pictures get changed because newspapers like to go with whatever they have in their catalogs. And, um, and uh, sometimes the headlines get slightly changed as well. But again, we, we do have some control over that. Uh, but the actual article, you know, the, the words in the actual articles never change. They can't change. So, yeah. Anybody else? Yeah? Um, yeah, no. So uh, you have to ha be at least a PhD student. And so we're quite um, strict about this. So, And if you're a PhD student, you should write about topics that are very close to, to your the subject of your thesis. If you're more senior, you can write a little bit more widely. But we do generally, I mean, sometimes we, we do get pitches by someone who's a mathematician who wants to write about why kids behave this way or something like that, which is not actually what they do research on. So it, very strictly, what you do research on is what you, you comment on and write about. Uh, but of course, you know, if you're a space researcher, you can write about quite a few different space things. And uh, so we're not, uh, but yeah, a PhD student at least. Mm -hmm. What do the members get that other universities don't take? Can mm -hmm. researchers from outside of your membership network yeah. pitches? Yes. So anyone technically can write for the conversation who is a member of a university. So you can't write if you're um, you know, employed by a, you know, a private company. Um, but uh, if you're a member of a university, you get, for instance, our expert request every morning. So you always know what we're looking for. Mm -hmm. You also get us coming out and doing training and workshops. Um, 
Uh, so the editors will come out and sit down with a few researchers and kind of talk to them about their research and try to help them to find stories. I mean, and also, um, you know, although anyone can technically write for us, we do, since we have 75 member universities, including Oxford, Cambridge, UCL, Manchester, it's very rare that someone's going to pitch something that we can't, that someone who is already a member can't write about. Uh, so, you know, we're, we're happy to accept those kind of stories if it's really original and, and, and so forth, but we would tend to go to our members first um, to, to get people. Is that, does that answer your question? Yeah. Oh yeah, do you? Yeah, yeah. So you can see all the stories from your institution. Is that what you mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it can be quite addictive. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we try to not get too hung up on, on reads and stuff. Some some of my favorite stories didn't get that many reads. Others uh, that just happened to have a good headline got loads of clicks, and you you can't completely predict those things. But um, yeah. We're trying to be responsible about it and covering all areas of science. Otherwise, I would just do like dinosaurs and black holes every day. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Can I ask about hmm? how much resistance you get to the turning the red to green? Like about some of the experiences you may have about how challenging that may sometimes be. Sorry, what exactly? It, well, when, when, when people write those, you know, the fifty-word sentences. <laughs> oh yeah, I see. Yeah, um, yeah. Every now and then, you know, you open the story and cry a little bit. But <laughs> but generally, I mean, I w I've been here for two and a half years, and I thought it was going to be uh, a lot harder for me. And actually, academics are, are are quite a lot of people are quite good writers, and you guys are all really smart as well. So of course, it's a different style of writing from writing a journal article. But once you've done it a couple of times, most people get a hang of it and then it's just great the next time. So, I mean, it's our job to kind of help people uh, learn uh, about that process. You know, you don't get paid for writing an article, but you can see it as free training um, because all the editing and, and all this stuff helps you uh, become a better writer for, for the public. Um, um, but, yeah, it can, it can be tricky and... Um, uh, usually, I mean, I, in my whole time at the conversation, I think it's only been once or twice that we've had to drop a story because we couldn't agree on on final edit. Or I think most people, when you when you do talk together, will understand that maybe this angle doesn't work so well for public audience. Maybe this would be better. But we're quite committed to to stories being accurate, obviously. So you know, we're not going to do something crazy that just completely misrepresents what you're saying. But there are ways to there are nuances there where there can be some debate. It's probably more that. The actual writing, I mean, that's not so hard to change. If something is written in a passive sentence, you write it to, to make it active. I mean, that's that's part of our job. And um, and most stories are quite well written, you know. Uh, and I also think that today, with the whole impact ag agenda and dissemination and all that, you're quite trained, like you're quite good at explaining the core of what you do, no matter how technical. That bit, just explaining, you know, to a public audience what it is you do, uh, you do quite well, so it's more about those things, finding a good angle, finding a time when it should be covered. It, it's maybe more those things, like um, like I was saying with the Nobel Prizes, pitching it far too late when everybody's already read about it. Just being aware of how of how the news cycle works. Um, so, yeah, we, there was um, we one time had a pitch about Back to the Future Day, the day after Back, Back to the Future Day, that sort of thing. That's a bit frustrating sometimes. Um, not so much the writing. The writing doesn't have to be perfect anyway. That's what we're there for. But yeah. <laughs> Anybody else have a question for you? Okay, thank you very much. Okay, thanks. <laughs>